The National Desk, America's News, now. nation's capital. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Didi Gatton, and on this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week, and we look ahead at what to expect. Back on American soil late Thursday night, three Americans who were unjustly imprisoned in Russia reuniting with their loved ones. Also meeting President Biden and Vice President Harris at Joint Base Andrews. They then continued on to Brook Army Medical Center in Texas for medical evaluation and from there, home. The National Desk, Matt Galka, has the details on the historic swap involving multiple countries. Their brutal ordeal is over and they're free. The president celebrated with the families of now freed prisoners. Jailed Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich had been detained in Russia for more than 490 days and former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan was arrested there nearly six years ago and had been a prisoner ever since. Both were released after the largest prisoner exchange between the United States and Russia since the end of the Cold War. We stand for freedom, for liberty, for justice, not only for our own people, but for others as well. And that's why all Americans can take pride in what we've achieved today. Russian-American journalist Alsu Kermasheva and legal resident Vladimir Karamurza will also be returning to America. They're part of a group of 16 people being released from Russia and heading to the U.S. and Germany. Russia is getting eight people back in the deal, including ones with ties to Russian intelligence and hacking. The apparent sticking point was Vadim Krasikov, a convicted murderer now freed from Germany and returning to his home. You know, if you have spoken to the families of the people who've had to go through this, you know what a, just a euphoric moment it is. But of course, that euphoria is always tempered by the knowledge of the kinds of criminals uh, that we trade innocent people mm -hmm. for. Russia has notoriously held prisoners in the past for leverage. Nearly two years ago, USA basketball star Brittany Griner was brought home in exchange for a Russian arms dealer nicknamed the Merchant of Death. The president was asked how to stop it from happening again going forward. Advising people not to go certain places. Tell them what's at risk, what's at stake. The Wall Street Journal reports that the complex negotiations were sealed when Biden was on a phone call with the Prime Minister of Slovenia on July 21st. About an hour later, he decided not to seek re-election. For the National Desk in Washington, I'm Matt Gelka. We now know the Air Force Osprey crash off the coast of Japan that killed all eight airmen on board was caused by a catastrophic failure of the aircraft's gearbox. The new report says the crack, along with the pilot's decision to keep flying, is now blamed for the tragedy. The lead investigator believes the pilot's instinct to complete a military exercise he helped plan for months kept him from addressing a series of six warnings in the cockpit. A 17-year-old boy has been charged for stabbing and killing three young girls in England. British authorities say Axel Rudakabana is charged with three counts of murder over the stabbings at a dance class in Southport. He's also facing 10 counts of attempted murder for the other eight children and two adults who were injured. English police are still searching for a motive. In your money, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell is leaving open the possibility of a September interest rate cut. But he says it all depends on what happens between now and then. The question will be whether the totality of the data, the evolving outlook, in the balance of risks are consistent with rising confidence on inflation and maintaining a solid labor market. Powell highlighting the Fed's careful balancing act between waging war on inflation and keeping unemployment low. Fed officials left rates unchanged this week, noting they need to make sure inflation is falling to their preferred 2% target. The majority of parents believe schools are asking them to buy too much as millions of families prepare to head back to school. According to the National Retail Federation, parents are expected to spend up to $38.8 billion on back-to-school shopping this year. Wallet Hub's Christine Mathern says many parents are turning to credit cards to support their children's needs. 77% of parents that are willing to go into debt for their children's education. So it's not just that people are feeling the pinch, 
but they know they have to pay it or they feel like this is very important to do so. Inflation has boosted prices in recent years. Experts say it's important to compare prices before buying and look for deals online. They also suggest using coupons and shopping on sales tax holidays to save. On Thursday. On Thursday, the Democratic National Convention kicked off its formal presidential nominating process, which they have to do before the convention because of an early ballot deadline in Ohio. Just two weeks ago, President Biden was expected to be the party's nominee. The National Desk, Atra al Nashar has a look at how Vice President Harris's condensed campaign timeline so far is working to her advantage. In 26 excruciating days for Democrats, their presidential prospects went from this. Everything we have to do is, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare. To this. When we fight, we win. God bless you. The dynamics of the race rapidly transformed by Vice President Kamala Harris's candidacy. After the Republican convention was a bit of a shock that caught a lot of Republicans by blindside. The condensed timeline of her presidential run puts Harris in a position no other candidate in modern history has been in. During a private fundraiser Wednesday, Harris told donors how she views her place in the race. Quote, let's level set. We have a fight in front of us and we have work to do. Hard work. Good hard work. An important thing a candidate must do is to frame their election and to do that right out of the blocks. Harris trying to do that in videos like this. The one thing Kamala Harris has always been, fearless. People's initial impression of her uh, was that she is tough and she's smart and she's, she's not shy. Harris still working to make a first impression with some key voters. A new AP NORC poll found 14% of independents don't know enough about her to form an opinion. The calendar is tight. Democratic delegates from across the country will cast their votes in the party's formal nominating process from Thursday to Monday night. On Tuesday, Harris will hold her first rally with her to-be-announced running mate in Philadelphia, kicking off a five-day swing state blitz. Nine days later, the Democratic National Convention kicks off in Chicago. A couple weeks after Labor Day, a handful of states start voting as early as September 20th. So far, Harris has been very much in control of her messaging, but as the campaign goes on, she'll be expected to sit down for interviews, participate in town halls, and have more unscripted moments so that voters who don't already know her can get a better sense of who she is. In Washington, I'm Atrel Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. A stark shift after President Biden drops out of the presidential race. Vice President Harris appears to have re-energized Democratic voters. According to a new AP Newark poll, 8 in 10 Democrats would be somewhat or very satisfied if Harris became their nominee. That figure was only 4 in 10 for President Biden. The poll also shows growing enthusiasm from several key groups like black and Hispanic adults and younger voters. New details on Donald Trump's 2020 election subversion charges. A federal judge in Washington, D.C. has regained control over his criminal case following the Supreme Court's ruling on immunity for former presidents. Judge Tanya Chutkin will now make a number of crucial decisions, including whether Trump's alleged efforts to undo the 2020 election results count as official acts. The case is not expected to reach trial before this year's presidential election. Hunter Biden won't find out his fate until the country elects a new president. A federal judge has scheduled his sentencing for November 13th, eight days after Election Day. The president's son faces up to 25 years in prison as well as a fine of up to $750,000. In June, a Delaware jury convicted Hunter on three felony gun charges. His attorneys have said they plan to challenge the verdict. New information on the killing of Georgia college student Lake and Riley. A tentative trial date has been set for her accused killer, Jose Abada, in mid-November. The defense is trying to move the case out of the area, arguing it will be impossible to find an impartial jury. Riley was found dead in a wooded area on the Augusta University campus in February after she didn't return from a run. The World Health Organization unveiled an initiative to accelerate the development of bird flu vaccines for humans. The project will be led by an Argentina pharmaceutical company using messenger RNA technology. mRNA vaccines teach the body how to make proteins to trigger an immune response to fight an infection. They were used to make COVID-19 vaccines.
The popular type 2 diabetes drug Ozempic has been flying off the shelves, but new medical research shows it might have some unintended side effects that go beyond weight loss. Emma Withrow joins us from the Fact Check team. We've been hearing a lot about this diabetes and weight loss drug. It's all over social media. Yeah, skyrocketing across the board. So Ozempic is just the brand name for semaglutide, which was approved in 2017 by the FDA for people with type 2 diabetes because it helps lower your blood sugar. But over time, doctors realized it really helped patients lose a significant amount of weight. According to Columbia University, about one-third of people taking Ozempic lost around 10% of their body weight. Wow, Huge. wow. And, you know, this is what we talk about. We hear a lot about the side effects of weight loss, but what are some of the other side effects beyond that? Yeah, so I dug into these studies that have been published, and a new study that was just unveiled at the Alzheimer's Association's International Conference found that people who took this type of drug for one year had an 18% slower cognitive decline compared to the ones who took a placebo. They also found that the drug appears to reduce shrinking in the parts of the brain that control our memory, learning, language, and decision making by nearly 50%. That is striking. I'm sure uh, more research will come out on this topic. Emma, thank you. And later on, Emma will be back to discuss the negative side effects of this drug and the skyrocketing rates of Americans using it. Just weeks before classes begin, another FAFSA setback could delay financial aid for college students this fall. On Tuesday, the Education Department said colleges will not be able to submit corrections in bulk to update students' financial aid records. Submitting revisions manually could delay student aid disbursements, leaving some students unable to pay their bills and fees on time. Coming up next here on the National Desk, crunching the numbers, both presidential candidates pitching their plans to rebuild the middle class. An expert breaks down what it could mean for your money. Plus, soaring road rage shootings. Alarming new numbers unveil the depth of the issue on U.S. roads. From the National True Cost of Living Coalition found that 65% of middle class Americans are struggling financially. Both Vice President Harris and former President Trump are promising to rebuild the middle class if elected. Joining Angela Brown to discuss is Pete Sepp, president of the National Taxpayers Union. Harris and, of course, Trump, they're making their pitch to the American people. Now, you've had a chance to go over, you know, their, their tax policies. Is there something that stands out that could really move the needle from either one of these policies for middle-class families? Well, unfortunately, you can see elements of tax plans that would move the needle the wrong way, a few that might move it the right way, and a lot that is still unclear in Vice President Harris's case, for example, as a presidential candidate way back when, she proposed huge tax increases, way bigger than her boss Joe Biden ever proposed and is currently proposing in his budget. So the question is, how much of her past will she repudiate? How much of the present will she embrace? And what in the future will she do to turn around some of the tax and spend policies that have characterized the Biden administration. You know, that's a good point, because you have to look at uh, the vice president at this point, kind of like from two angles, both, both from under the Biden administration, also which she proposed as senator. And let's get, first start with the Biden administration. Um, you said if Harris is elected and carries out the priorities of the Biden administration, uh, she would be advocating for this, a 10-year, $4.4 trillion tax hike and a $17.1 trillion in deficit. Now, kind of break down what those taxes would be and what what that would mean for the middle class. What this amounts to is the repeal of many of the 2017 tax relief provisions. The Biden administration has said that they only want to do that for families with $400,000 or more in income. Vice President Harris recently said she would abide by that pledge, okay. not raise taxes on anyone below that $400,000 level. Problem is, the administration's already done that with its tariff policy, so middle class is already getting hit there. They're getting hit by inflation. Other tax increases that Vice President Harris proposed when she was on the campaign trail would dwarf those of her boss, 
uh, Biden administration's proposing to raise the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28 percent. She advocated 35 percent. That's important to the middle class because the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office says that when you raise corporate taxes, you depress wages. Wage growth was one of the most important parts of the 2017 tax relief law. It put between $550 and $2,000 into the pockets of middle class families by increasing economic growth. Why would you want to tinker with that? Well, let's well talk about what, both Biden and Harris do. Well, let's talk about one proposal when she was senator. This was regarding um, implementing a tax credit, 3000 for single, 6000 for uh, married people um, that could cost 2.8 trillion but there's also the flip side where they said uh, according to the tax po policy center that it could actually help middle class families what do you make of that it could help except for the fact that it would come at the expense of repealing the 2017 tax relief law for those same middle class households so you're really stuck in neutral you're replacing one set of tax relief for another and you're doing it very inefficiently a straight out credit instead of various tax policies that help to trigger economic growth and in fact Tax Foundation estimated an 855,000 job loss from Harris's plan. Well, so that would take a step backward, even though she's trying to provide relief for the middle class. Let's talk about uh, former President Donald Trump. Of course, he's floated several uh, policy ideas, ex including extending the 2017 tax cuts, uh, further reduce the corporate income tax rate as well, but also impose a 10 percent or higher universal baseline tariff that you have some economists are saying will actually um, hurt the middle class and costing them around seventeen hundred dollars. What do you make yeah, of that? In fact most economists would say that because tariffs are not an imposition on the country importing the goods. It's a tax on the people in the United States who buy the goods. And so when a, a politician says, I want to raise tariffs but not taxes, there's no difference there. You're going to pay a lot more money at the cash register because of government policy. And the Trump proposal would be a costly one for the middle class. I'm not sure how much the renewal of the 2017 tax relief would offset that. But we have to take a very hard look at our trade policies because they are also tax policies. Well, thank you so much for your insight. President of the National Taxpayers Association Union, Peter Sepp, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Road rage shootings are on the rise in the U.S. A recent analysis shows these shootings have increased by more than 400% in just nine years. The National Desk, Janae Bowens, takes a deeper look at the violent statistics. I got my hands on a new study that shows 777 people have been killed in road rage shootings over the last decade. I've been looking at different cases, and I must warn you, the one I'm about to share is graphic. I that was the devastating moment Delonte Hicks was shot on a Maryland highway by a driver he had exchanged words with. Hicks died that day and left behind three kids and his fiance. You can see the change in my children. You can see a little light diminish from them. It, it broke me. It was the worst thing I ever heard in my life. Police are still looking for the suspect. These incidents are becoming more common. A recent report from The Trace, an organization dedicated to reporting on gun violence shows, the number of people shot in road rage incidents increased from 92 in 2014 to 481 last year. Guns are more readily available. I think that we are, we feel more threatened. I think we came out of the pandemic and we all thought, yay, it's over. We are still feeling the effects of that. And it's affected how our need to feel like that we have to take care of ourselves to survive. Dr. Lee Richardson is the CEO of the Brain Performance Center in Dallas, Texas. She says road rage comes from environmental and psychological factors. They're, they're in a reactionary mode. They're constantly reacting. And they're not taking, taking the time to stop and think through the consequences. Sometimes those consequences can negatively change someone's life forever. It was senseless. It didn't make any sense. If you're near someone driving aggressively, do not engage and avoid eye contact. I'm Janae Bowens reporting.
Just ahead, protesting the Olympics, why one restaurant in Ohio is refusing to air the 2024 Paris Games. Plus, an uptick in positive tests as some experts worried about the West Nile virus, the states where mosquitoes are spreading the illness. team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America and we begin in Ohio where a group of local restaurants is boycotting the Olympics citing a scene from the opening ceremony is their reasoning. However, some residents don't see a reason for the protest. <laughs> It's the talk of the town. I mean, honestly, I think it's kind of ridiculous. And social media. One person commenting, quote, stopping in for a bowl today. I didn't understand why everyone was kind of getting upset. Town Hall, Mandrake Rooftop, and Rebel posted on social media. We are protesting the 2024 Paris Olympics. Their reason, this scene from the opening ceremony. They wrote, quote, the betrayal of the Last Supper was handled with an irresponsible level of irreverence, insulting the Christian faith. Some say this scene's mocking Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper. But the Olympics posted this on X Friday. Quote, the interpretation of the Greek god of Dionysus makes us aware of the absurdity of violence between human beings. So it wasn't like anything was being like titillating or sensational. It was a performance. In Texas, multiple mosquitoes have tested positive for the West Nile virus. Experts say it's still early in the season, so an uptick in positive tests gives pause for concern. There have been nine confirmed human cases in the states of Texas, and the people who are infected might not realize it. The problem is about one in 100, one in 150 cases can become quite severe, and that can lead to what's called neuroinvasive disease, where the virus is entering the central nervous system. Experts say taking extra precautions, such as using bug spray that contains DEET and covering up, can keep you safe. In California, the Park Fire has grown into one of the largest fires in state history. It has destroyed hundreds of structures, including people's homes and personal belongings. Local musician Yamo Aka was forced to evacuate, only to return to a pile of ashes. But he's keeping a positive outlook despite the setback. All my friends, we may have all lost our, our houses, but we're all still here. We're going to come back together and we're going to rebuild and we're actually probably going to have a great time doing it. Aka is planning a benefit concert in Chico on August 17th. Proceeds will help fire victims recover. Coming up, a major change is coming to Taco Bell drive throughs Why the next person taking your order may not be a person at all. Plus, getting mixed signals, dark chocolate, often hailed for its alleged health benefits, the toxic ingredients it could contain as well. A new study shows dark chocolate and similar cocoa products contain dangerous amounts of lead and cadmium. The two are linked to cancer, chronic disease, or reproductive and developmental issues, especially in children. This research does have limitations to consider. First, researchers only looked at a relatively small number of products and focused on products available for purchase in the domestic U.S. Well, you may soon be talking to AI instead of a real person at Taco Bell drive throughs The fast food chain is is expanding its use of artificial intelligence voice technology to hundreds of U.S. locations by the end of the year. The technology is already currently being used in more than 100 locations in 13 states. Taco Bell's parent company says voice AI will not replace any workers. It just allows them to focus on other priorities. The White House executive chef has now retired after cooking for five presidents and their families over 29 years. Christetta Comerford was the first woman and person of color to hold the top job in the White House kitchen. She migrated from Manila in the Philippines when she was 23 years old and started working during the Clinton administration. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back.
The National Desk, America's News, now. Derailment deal. Residents injured in East Palestine can now receive funds for their medical bills, what they have to give up in return. Plus, protest punishment after some pro-Palestinian demonstrations on college campuses turned violent. Some students are now facing consequences. And later, overdosing on Ozempic, how patients can end up taking the wrong amount of the drug as prescriptions continue to skyrocket. Residents near East Palestine, Ohio, can now receive at least $25,000 for injuries from the Norfolk Southern train derailment. This payment is part of a $600 million class action settlement. Lawyers have successfully negotiated an increase from the original injury payment. To receive this compensation, residents must forfeit their right to file future claims against the railroad for serious health issues. Right now, a $10,000 reward is being offered for information that leads to the return of a missing transgender advocate. Taylor Casey of Chicago was last seen on June 19th near Paradise Island in the Bahamas. The 42-year-old was taking part in a yoga retreat and was reported missing the next day by employees. Casey's family and friends are pushing for the FBI to get involved alongside a social media campaign. Protests over the Israel-Hamas war on college campuses have died down, but some student protesters are paying the price. Joining Angela Brown to discuss is Emily Sturge, University of Florida student and correspondent for conservative watchdog group Campus Reform. Well, you're a student at the University of Florida, and you have just suspended students who were arrested in those anti-Israel protests. Currently, six students are facing three to four year suspensions. Now, once again, you're a correspondent for Campus Perform. What are you hearing on the ground from students, and even about the protests, of course, and also the suspensions being handed down? I am a student, so I do know that the University of Florida has the largest Jewish population out of any public university in the country. So many students are very thankful that the university took such swift action to address the anti-Israel protests that had gotten out of hand on our campus. Other students have expressed concerns about free speech, but let me be clear, the University of Florida encouraged students to exercise their right to free speech, but did let them know that there were clearly prohibited activities that would result in their suspension. For example, no amplified sound, no threats, no violence. Many of these students broke these rules. Some students, uh, one student allegedly spit on a police officer. Protesters resisted police officers, and I don't believe that's the behavior that should be happening on a college campus. The University of Florida sent a very clear message. They said that anti-Semitism will not be tolerated and that law and order will be upheld. Well, you have a network, Campus Reform, um, you guys have a network of correspondents across the country, and you talk about the suspensions at UF. What are you hearing from your network of reporters at other campuses where some of these demonstrations happen about suspensions at other campuses? Is this something that is happening nationwide? At the Leadership Institute's campus reform, we've done extensive reporting on the anti-Israel protests that have taken place at colleges and universities nationwide. We've seen a wide range of reactions from college administrators. Some university administrations, um, like at Columbia University, chose to negotiate with these anti-Israel protesters, while other university presidents have been a bit firmer in their approach. Uh, for example, at my university, the University of Florida, our president, Ben Sass took a very firm approach and he stood up to these anti-Israel protests. At Campus Reform, we've reported that over 70% of Jewish students say that they feel less safe on college campuses following the October 7th attacks on Israel by Hamas. So with these statistics in mind, I think the University of Florida led a great example of how university administrations should uphold law and order on their campus and continue to maintain a healthy campus environment for all students. And I believe that other universities should follow suit. You know, obviously you go to college to get a degree and then hopefully get a job, and this punishment is extending far beyond college campuses. And there was a recent study that came out in Intelligent that found that around 3 in 10 college students or recent grads had job offers rescinded uh, because of their pro-Palestinian activism. Um, campus reform, you hear from these companies? 
or some companies? Yeah. What are companies doing? We are reporting a growing trend of biz businesses moving away from embracing ideological activism because they're realizing that it's just not productive in the workplace. Some businesses have started screening job applicants and doing extensive background checks on candidates, and some businesses are even pulling back job offers from some students that have participated in these very violent anti-Israel campus protests. We've reported that three in 10 campus protesters for these pro-Palestine movements have had job offers rescinded in the past six months. So that means 70% of employers are asking Gen Z applicants about their protest involvement on campus and some are even pulling back job opportunities. I think these statistics are a major wake up call for protesters, specifically the violent protesters uh, who hope to have a job one day. These students are facing accountability for their actions and they're making themselves unemployable un unemployable while joining such a hateful movement and causing chaos and massive disruptions on college campuses. All right, thanks for joining us. University of Florida student and cons correspondent for conservative college watchdog group Campus Reform, Emily Sturge. Once again, good luck in your studies and, and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Most renters feel like home ownership is not in the cards for them. According to a new CNN poll, 86% say they would like to buy a home, but they can't afford one. Among those, 54% think they will never be able to afford one. Younger Americans are more hopeful the situation will change. The poll found 53% of adults younger than 45 believe they will buy a home eventually. The hottest summer on record is now expected to drive up the cost of fruits and vegetables. While inflation has been cooling since hitting a four decade high, some farmers say they are no match for on the hottest summers on record. In fact, the earth experienced the hottest day in recorded history last week. Right now, a group of inmates is suing Texas over scorching temps in state prisons. Only 30% of Texas prisons have air conditioning at all. And a recent study found temps regularly reach over 110 degrees with at least one reaching 149. While county and federal prisons in Texas have temperature maximums, state prisons do not. The lawsuit also alleging the extreme heat has led to hundreds of inmate deaths in recent years. A popular medication for weight loss and potentially Alzheimer's disease is making headlines after the FDA issued a warning on overdoses. Emma from the Fact Check team joins us now. It's all over social media. You dug into the data on Ozempic use. Tell us more about what you found. Yeah, Didi. So the FDA actually says it's received dozens of reports on people overdosing on Ozempic, also known as semaglutide, by giving themselves as much as 20 times more than their dose prescribed. They said the dosing errors are mostly happening when patients measure and inject themselves, but have also happened as a result of health care providers miscalculating the needed doses for this medication. 20 times more than their prescribed dose. That is really striking. Uh, Ozempic has, as we mentioned, risen in popularity in recent years. Can you break down uh, the stats on how often it's being prescribed? Sure, yeah, it really has skyrocketed. Um, according to UCLA, Ozempic has become the most common way to treat type 2 diabetes, reducing the risk of heart disease and also just helping obese people lose weight. 1.7% of people in the U.S. were prescribed some type of semaglutide medication in 2023. And Ozempic sales have also just gone through the roof with its manufacturer becoming the biggest company in Europe in 2023. So with the increase in these prescriptions, obviously comes the potential for an increase of misusing them. Right, absolutely. Emma, thank you. And for more on this fact to team topic, all the numbers that Emma just mentioned, including links to sources, scan the QR code on your screen or visit the nationaldesk.com. This week, we are tracking reports of blood shortages in cities and states nationwide because of the crowd strike outage. The glitch shut down computer systems, leading to delayed blood supply shipments and blood donation scheduling. The Pacific Northwest, including Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, are all facing shortages. In other states, particularly in the Northeast, there are urgent calls for O-type blood donations. You see those states here on your screen in yellow. New developments, Delta Airlines has hired high profile attorney David Boyd's law firm to seek damages from cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike and Microsoft. The outage last week left the air carrier unable to find the pilots and flight attendants it needed to operate. 
According to FlightAware, Delta was forced to cancel 6,300 flights and delay 9,300 others over five days. An aviation analyst estimates the software issue cost Delta between $325 and $475 million. In two weeks, lawmakers on Capitol Hill will be banned from using TikTok on their work devices. The House Cybersecurity Operation sent out a notice alerting staff about initiating the removal of all ByteDance apps from all House devices starting August 15th. Concerns about China's reported collection of TikTok users' personal data triggered the ban. ByteDance has vowed to forge ahead with court challenges against the bill. California mom Sonia Gomez was the victim of a Facebook takeover. They had sent me something like at 2 in the morning saying that there was a login in Hong Kong. Within hours, hackers falsely posted she had a new job at Crypto.com and was helping people make big money. I've never worked in crypto, ever, ever, ever. The scammers changed her password and locked her out, but Gomez says Facebook wouldn't help. Every time I would report it, they would respond like they don't see nothing wrong with this page. It turned into to a several month ordeal to regain control of her own page. Facebook will do absolutely nothing about. It. Look at this. Scott Vreeland of Georgia also says Facebook wouldn't help him when his deceased brother's account was hacked. Sean Vreeland was a disabled Army veteran. After he died of a heart attack in 2022, scammers took over his account, using it to pitch yet another cryptocurrency scam. The scammer also removed all of the posts from the family saying, you know, condolences and all that stuff and all the pictures we had posted. Vreeland says Facebook wouldn't respond even after he mailed them his brother's death certificate. My brother was a hardworking man. He was honest. He was a veteran and he really deserves to rest with, you know, with a clean name and rest in peace. Unfortunately, Vreeland and Gomez are far from alone. Earlier this year, a bipartisan group of 41 state attorneys general sent a letter to Meta, Facebook and Instagram's parent company, demanding immediate action to address what they called a dramatic and persistent spike in complaints about account takeovers and lockouts. They cited sharp increases in multiple states, complaints up 270 percent in Pennsylvania, 256 percent in Illinois, 330 percent in North Carolina, and 740% in Vermont. There is no legitimate phone number for customer service for any of the social media account platforms, period. Eva Velasquez is president and CEO of the nonprofit Identity Theft Resource Center. She blames growing complaints on shrinking customer service. They don't have enough people actually providing this support to users. They've tried to automate everything. No matter how frustrated you get, unfortunately, there's not much you can do, even if a social media platform won't take down fraudulent information. Those lengthy terms of service agreements most of us just click and accept are packed with legalese that overwhelmingly give the companies an edge if you try to sue. Even more protection comes from Section 230 of the Communications Act, a 30-year-old law that shields social media companies from liability. Congress has been working to update the law for years with no success. Why is this taking so long? Well, there's a lot of powerful interests. There's a lot of disagreement. Some politics gets in the way. Orlando area representative Darren Soto is pushing for Congress to do more to regulate social media giants. We want to be able to shield people's identities from this kind of theft that happens online. In April, he introduced the SHIELD Act to give social media users more legal rights to get platforms to take down false information and potentially sue if the companies don't do it in a timely fashion. You can't have privacy rights and no ability to enforce them. That's a toothless tiger. Spotlight on America contacted Meta about the rise in complaints over account takeovers. A spokesperson didn't answer our specific questions, but sent a statement saying, we know that losing and recovering access to your online accounts can be a frustrating experience. We invest heavily in designing account security systems to help prevent account compromise in the first place. And the brother of veteran Sean Vreeland ended up filing suit against Facebook to get their attention. After eight Eight months, Vreeland says the social media giant finally memorialized his brother's account this April. 
For Spotlight on America, I'm Angie Moreski. Still to come, our team of correspondents breaks down this week in Washington from next steps for the DNC and the presidential nomination process to the prisoner swap between the U.S. and Russia. Welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day, and our team of correspondents reports on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. By this time next week, Kamala Harris will be officially be the Democratic presidential nominee, and she'll be traveling the country with her running mate, national correspondent Atra Elnishar. The way her campaign is playing out is not something those of us who've covered presidential campaign politics has seen, at least in our careers. Yeah, Steve, uh, Kamala Harris is in a position that no other candidate has been in in modern times. And so far, it is working to her advantage. So this time, you know, two, three weeks ago, we thought this presidential election would be decided in large part by these double haters, voters who did not like either Biden nor Trump and might either sit this one out or vote third party. Now the, the equation has been totally flipped upside down because Harris is seen as this newer, younger, energetic uh, part of a part of this election. Yes, she is she is an incumbent in that she's a vice president, but by no means is she uh, seen in the same way that Biden was as far as an incumbent goes. Uh, so she's absolutely re-energized Democrats, many of whom were really, you know, resigning to the fact that this could be a Trump victory in November. Uh, she's broken fundraising records, these Zoom calls, white dudes for Harris, for instance, getting more than 100,000 people participating. And what we're going to see in these last three months or so is her try and introduce herself to these voters who aren't already familiar. Less than three months, three, about three months or so until election day. So it, it's, you know, you're hearing this honeymoon period perhaps, but right now uh, this condensed timeline isn't making way for the same kinds of fatigue or errors that you might see in a 500 day campaign. A honeymoon period likely to last a little bit longer with the Veep announcement and with the convention coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, probably uh, uh, we'll be seeing that honeymoon last a few more weeks. Meanwhile, a historic prisoner swap between the U.S. and Russia this past week. National correspondent Matt Galka, what are the details there? Yeah, uh, Steve, this is uh, the, the biggest prisoner swap between the U.S. and Russia since the end of the Cold War, roughly 30 years or so. The big names here, Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich, who's been imprisoned for a little more than a year, and former Marine Paul uh, Whelan, who's uh, been in prison in Russia for almost six years. They were part of a group of four people who are coming back to the U.S., another 10, um, some uh, Russian citizens and some uh, other citizens of other countries, of uh, U.S. allies, um, about 16 people total released from Russia uh, in a prisoner swap. So swap being the key there, that means Russia is getting some people back too. And as happens with these prisoner swaps that we've seen in the past, some of those people are not good people. Uh, the group that Russia is getting back, eight people, some of them are involved with Russian intelligence, hacking ties, but uh, the big name was uh, an imprisoned man in Germany, basically an assassin who had killed a Georgian national in Berlin and was a convicted murderer there. He is released. He is going back to Russia in this prisoner swamp. But again, this has been something that uh, Americans, especially the families of these people that are coming back home, they have been wanting to see for quite some time. It was just two years ago we saw Brittany Griner, the USA basketball player. She came back in a prisoner swamp for an arms dealer that was known as the Merchant of Death, and Paul Whelan was not involved in that, and uh, the U.S. and the Biden administration got heat for that at the time, but he is coming back. Um, so again, the families are happy. The prisoner swap is happening. And, and just one detail, the Wall Street Journal says that this was all wrapped up on July 21st. The president, Joe Biden, had uh, sealed the deal with the Slovenian prime minister, and he just about an hour later after he had that phone call, he decided he wasn't running for re-election. So things um, things came together real quick, and then he made one of the biggest decisions of his life. But a lot going on this past month, Steve. Kayla, Matt, Autra, thank you all for your hard work. Back to you. Coming up next here on the National Desk, food delivery drivers leading the business. How junk fees on the apps are driving up costs and driving down business.
Lies six suspects on the run after attacking two people sleeping on the street. The shocking unprovoked assault caught on camera. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From an arson investigation in New York to an assault caught on camera in Maryland. We're taking the pulse of America, but we start in Washington State, where residents are outraged over a possible hike in delivery fees. A sure sign of the lunch rush at Seattle Center is the rotation of gig workers at food pickup windows. DoorDash confirms on its website those deliveries could soon cost even more. The company plans to add an extra $1.99 on certain long-distance orders since they take more effort to complete, and a $1.99 minimum service fee for orders from DashPatch subscribers. They're trying to get out of paying their responsibility and pushing it off to the customers. Some customers are quick to admit their days of ordering delivery in Seattle are in the rear view because of the existing taxes and fees. They take an $18 meal and turn it into $35, $36, and now add two more dollars onto that? I'm not going to do it. A devastating fire early Monday morning in Rochester is now being investigated as arson. The investigators that were on the scene, you know, quickly obtained evidence that clearly indicated that this was intentionally set at the point of entry. The investigators believe the, site, the fire was set by more than one person. The suspects may consist of males and or females. Flames spread quickly at the Portland Avenue home, trapping five-year-old Malachi Stovall in his second story bedroom. There was a 19-year-old babysitter that was spending the night to watch him. The fire, it spread so quickly that the babysitter was physically unable to make it up to even attempt to make it up to the second floor to get the child out. Downtown Silver Spring, 4.43 a.m. July 16th. Police say a dark-colored Honda Civic pulls up. Five males and one female get out, and they begin what appears to be a totally unprovoked attack on members of the homeless community sleeping in Veterans Plaza. Just absolutely disgusting. Nikki Hawkins has been with Montgomery County Police 13 years, and within the past year, working with members of the homeless community became her primary job. She says she's never seen seen anything like this. They don't have much of anything. They are sleeping on the street. And for this to happen, it's it's just mind boggling. Still ahead here are nearly 2 million Teslas under a dangerous recall. Which vehicles are being impacted by the glitch causing the hood of the car to fly open? An important consumer alert for Tesla owners, nearly 2 million vehicles are being recalled because software can fail to detect unlatched hoods. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says that could cause the hood to suddenly fly open and block the driver's view. Impacted vehicles include Model S, Model X, Model 3, and Model Ys from 2020 to 2024. Tesla has released a software update to fix the issue. Right now, a helicopter pilot is being hailed a hero for saving a dog and her four puppies from the park fire in Northern California. A resident was forced to leave the Rottweilers behind when their car broke down while evacuating last week. The owner alerted authorities to the dog's location and on Saturday, the pilot flew to the area to rescue them. Unfortunately, one of the Rottweilers did not survive. The pilot flew the other five dogs to safety and an animal rescue group is now caring for them. So cute to see them there. That'll be all for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Check your local listings. You can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on the nationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of the National Desk. I'm Dee Gadden, and from all of us here, have a great week.